conscience. So environmental awareness should be a duty and technological evolution can be an excellent ally. Up to what extent companies are committed to that challenge is what we are going to listen on. Our uh, guests are Anna Casata from Galp, Bruno Martini, Accenture, Juan Oliveira Ericsson, and Sergio Catalão, Nokia, Portugal. That I would like to thank for your presence. Anna, starting with you, Galp with fossil fuel as their one of their main businesses. How has the company considered this um, topic? What is it doing in favor of sustainability? Uh, thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's quite a pleasure to be able to address you. Galp has, is fully engaged with sustainability and why? Because if we think about the world's uh, energy consumption, 80% is based on fossil. So along uh, these lines, when we speak about tra energy transition, it means that so as to become greener with low carbon technology, we need to have the capacity to invest in new technologies, invest in new solutions of low carbon. And this is the path. This is... Um, the direction chosen. That's why the energy sector speaks about the en it, that it's an energy transition. Obviously, will be nurture on technological disruption, but it's a technological uh, transition that it be uh, inclusive and equitable, which is also a key factor to be able to reach 2050 with a world with a uh, zero, neutral zero world to reach it is our import is uh, an important objective for Galp in terms of products it produces. We'll be supporting our customers so that final uh, our end users and um, others can find new solution. Galp uh, took uh, an important decision that is it's a company where its matrix in terms of profitability comes from is based on oil and gas products and today as I mentioned 80% of our 80% uh, of our consumers all over the world still have needs uh, for that energy source and that's why the sustainability That's why sustainability is more focused. I think it's more focused on it's the energy company society regulators in a collaborative way will be part of that solution in open transparency that there's still a road to be paved. And oil and gas uh, companies, especially GAP, uh, investments will be made in low carbon energies in fossil fuel uh, which is more sustainable in supporting electrification um, um, because only as such will we be able to move towards this transition the energetic transition which is more sustainable and greener will have to require more electrification more fossil fuel and more renewables but just to mention that for this to be possible, it needs a huge investment in people and technology because 50% of the technology we need for that energy transition do not exist or are at an embryo stage. These, this is data from the uh, Energy Interna International Energy Association that is 103, 123 trillion trillions of investment to reach it, it's quite a huge challenge that um, society faces and energy companies as GALP will play a very important uh, role. It's a challenge. I will ask you to give us concrete examples of green energies. Bruno Mertins, we're speaking about two speeds, two realities at high speed. On one hand, sustainability, which is a race against time and technology, which is moving um, every day. How has uh, Accenture dealt with this uh, topic? Good morning, um, 
everyone and on behalf of Accenture to thank this invitation. When the digital started to, uh, to being part of the Lexit, in, in, we say that the business is all and digital. It's digital and sustainable. So sustainable sustainability and digital is part of the company's development and their commitment on how they create value for all stakeholders. And essentially, there are six um, action lines, um, such as uh, Accenture and other companies, try to promote these sustainable practices, and essentially around the net zero carbonization in the utilities energy sector from, a, as Anna mentioned, um, transition to a more sustainable energy mix, the smart grids, smart grids, uh, distributing uh, power will be smart if we apply digital technology and also the energy uh, services that are connected. For instance, one which was which has been quite successful has been electric mobility. Electric mobility is a sustainable practice. It's a change of habits, but also has to be followed because um, in addition to have an electric vehicle, I have to use renewables because if I'm using fossil energy, we're, we're um, not giving um, its due importance. Then um, aspects related to circular economy, the, the um, supply chain, to understand that my partners, clients, my value uh, chain end to end supply chain is sustainable and to promote circular economy a third topic around technology around green technology not only it green it or the so-called green cloud which relates to practices using cloud with data processing uh, fueled by renewables energy in uh, software processing, the best uh, coding practices, a lot has to do with a fourth factor that is measuring sustainability. We're not able to act if we do not measure. So the analytical reporting um, aspect to stakeholders, regulators, the data component, which is of the utmost importance, that is part of all our talks. Organizations, that is how the operative model of organization can be rethought of being more sustainable. Leadership to employees, le leadership, and a sixth point relating to customers, brands, experiences, what we provide to our customers and employees to enhance digital and to promote sustainable practices. So sustainability in the end goes uh, intersects and you spoke about the leadership, and it's important for this message to be passed on. Yes, lead by examples, lead led by examples. So it starts with leadership. Of course, leadership is limited by a regulatory, economic, social context, which also is going to promote that all uh, companies adopt sustainability, the sustainability angle. We carried out a study in 2000 uh, corporation, 34% have commitments that have been agreed on with their stakeholders um, by 2050 being uh, net zero like uh, GALP, net zero uh, carbon emission. And 93% of these 34% of uh, corporations will fail if they do not double their investments and this acceleration. And this is done through leadership. That is how commitments, investments are carried out. That is 90% means quite a lot. Uh, we will uh, speak about that aspect later on. Maybe to introduce a more technological dimension, Juan, why is the 5G technology, why can it be that important for sustainability? Why is it that important? Well, uh, mucho obrigado por el convite. Th thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, my Portuguese is not very good. It's actually, it's very bad. You know, what they were talking before in the previous panel and what they were mentioning is the basis is the digitalization, right? And, and as we understand it today, to make it happen, we need 
5G. I'm sure Sergio will, will, will convey the same message in, in the sense that 5G is not yet another G. It's much more than that. It's a, it's a complete revolution end-to-end -end of the mobile networks. And, and the potential is huge, right? Here I have one good news and one bad news. The, the good news is that the technology exists. You know? The bad news is we, we are lagging behind. You know, in Portugal and, and, and in Europe, we are lagging behind. We believe that 5G will be transformational to catalyzing the net zero. And, and why, why is that? Why are we behind? Why are we behind? Why are we lagging behind? So when you compare to the front runners, the, the usual suspects, uh, the US, Japan, South Korea, uh, we, we don't really see in Europe yet mid-band, massive mid-band deployments. Mid-band is, you know, the, 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 the band that will allow the, the throughput, you know, that will enable the use cases that, bring, that 5G will bring. We don't have, we haven't launched a standalone, which is the end-to-end -end 5G technology from the access to the core. That hasn't happened in Portugal yet and has only happened in very few European countries, whereas in the US, for instance, the, the standalone network 5G was launched back in 2020. That is three years ago. I think in Europe we lost the trend of 4G and we are about to lose the trend of 5G it, if we don't put the remedies. What can we do? I think we all need to be aware of where we are. We need to push for public and private collaboration, that, that is key, to make it happen. Because as I was saying, it will be transformational to achieve the net zero. And we don't believe net zero as a target, but as a way of working. You know, net, net zero, if, if we see it as a target, we are making a mistake. We believe 5G will be key also to, uh, to drive the digital inclusion. Today, globally, there are 2.7 billion people unconnected. That's a reality. And then we'll, 5G also will enable the industry transformation. And, and that will, our study says that uh, in, with connectivity, we can decrease the emissions by 15% before 2030. Uh, and if on top of the connectivity we put 5G cases, that can run up to 20, 25%. That means that is equivalent to remove one out of seven cars out of European Union roads, and it's also equivalent to remove the emissions together of Spain and Italy in European Union. So this is why we believe 5G is key. Tim said, de facto, aqui um. So we. So there's quite a big challenge ahead. I don't know if you agree with what Juan has said. How can 5G contribute to environmental efficiency? Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to thank the invitation address by APDC, who shared you to participate in this uh, Congress on disruption where um, sustainability was not left behind. It has several dimensions in 2015 when the United Nations established to find the objective for 2020, 2030, such as poverty, um, hunger, and education, and also the climate change, climate action, that also in 2015 um, led to uh, the Paris Treaty establishing very uh, clear goals on climate, on the climate actions. And um, I tried to, to um, what I'd like to say is we're halfway through this, this, this 15 year journey. Will we, will we be able to achieve the objective as society and nations we propose for 2030? Yes. Uh, of course, technology today plays an essential role more than ever, and this sector has a unique opportunity to solve challenges in, of the world. 5G is part of the tech, the, that technology, there are more. When we carry out deployments in 5G, there are some fixed areas, optical fiber, which will make available uh, this connectivity, which is necessary. Our approach, our approach to sustainability lies within three dimensions to maximize, optimize uh, the positive impact. And this is what we're doing with our customers via projects, projects in a fixed mobile and cloud to 
the carbonate industries to promote a digital transition, for instance, in the energy sector, to connect fixed mobile access to reduce the digital gap. Several example, 2,500, 2.5 million clients using and them in several industry sectors to uh, taking advantage of Anna's presence in this panel. Let me emphasize the mining industry, the mining industry, which is moving towards, and Anna mentioned, um, a, a, an intense disruption of uh, fuel, quite oil gas reliant, which will be a contribution um, in terms of metal aspect when you look at a wind uh, turbine, it needs 2,000 tons to be made of steel. Electric vehicle need a liquid va battery. So this mining industry is surely, and uh, surely enough, will be strategic in terms of the digital transition 5G. We have hundreds of projects in the world where we're applying 5G technology for digitalization, automation of that sector. A second aspect. Um, of our uh, sustainability approaches to minimize the negative impact, that is the footprint. We're doing this through uh, the energy efficiency circularity of our products, but also uh, through our production chains and operations. So we have here clear commitments uh, regarding these uh, sectors. And last year, we launched a new generation of processors for fixed uh, uh, mobile n n network, uh, increasing our energy, um, the energy sector with a footprint, which is much more interesting. And then also with a clear commitment by 2025, so that our operations are carried out all over the world using uh, renewables at 90%. And also the challenges align with that of the UN in, by 2030, our, our value change production, um, that is our partners are very important, with a CO2 reduction by 50%. And last aspect relating to sustainability, our practices, a clear investment in business practices which are robust, ethical, for a more sustainable world. This is a unique opportunity to solve the more challenges techno technology is fundamental green without digital seven years still uh, ahead where we are going to use the technological resources available five including 5g we need to monetize a channel 5g in that direction and i think that we're at a point uh, in spite of being more ahead uh, this industry has shown that by giving uh, many steps the necessary steps we can provide a big contribution to accelerate, and I believe that in relation to Juan, I'm not that pes I'm not that pessimistic that we're lagging behind, but we have great opportunities that still lie ahead. That is seven years uh, for 2030 to be achieved, and we have a strong commitment with society, our customers, partners, and also our employees for an approach to sustainability for our approach that is on contributing to a better sustainable world. It's quite a long path and we have to be all committed. Anna, sustainability is in Galp's uh, case is the sign indication of new business. What did Galp do in the last year that you can give us as an example within uh, the sustainability? aspect i'm going to speak about two um value chains electric mobility that uh, bruno mentioned galp is a leader in our country in mo in uh, uh, electrical in electric vehicle mobility and then electric and then i'm going to mention an example on the electrification of the more difficult sectors concerning emissions now on electrical mobility we uh, should address two huge challenges as Europe. The first challenge is our ability, that is all, in massifying the access to uh, chargers. It's as simple as this. We were able to have infrastructures that allow us to charge everywhere, at home, 
in in the office in um uh, um service stations wherever and uh, We're doing quite a lot of work in uh, innovation with a startup. We're trying to test solutions. We're even testing, as I'm saying, testing solutions. It's an embryo solution we, uh, which will enable that everyone is able without a change in infrastructure to charge their uh, car, even if this is going slowly in um, the, where they can in the city. When we're speaking about electric mobility, there's a huge opportunity at a European level today. When we speak about new value chains, we have to speak about new sustainable by design chains. Electric mobility for us so that we can move towards a transport transition to be able to achieve to have more electric vehicles, we need lithium batteries we will need lithium as a critical mineral and if we think about the value change of lithium batteries 80 percent 80 percent of lithium batteries are produced in china 60 percent of which are produced with a um, carbon uh, energy source in europe when we have the landmark that is 30 percent of car batteries electric cars will have to be produced this is sustainably designed this is the plan and they, it's quite a challenge in europe it's also an opportunity to be able to have industries and lithium refineries to be able to to have then a policy, a mineral policy allowing access in a quick, sustainable, respecting, as we've always been respecting all environmental uh, issues in, uh, in uh, Europe, uh, safety, access to lithium, and the recycling of the lithium itself exists. So when we think about mining, refining, assembly of batteries and then recycling there's a new industry which is being built in europe with several new opportunities connecting what was said with our with the previous panel new opportunities new necessary skills of new uh, professional opportunities for young people this is an example um, regarding mobility, also uh, the example of green hydrogen, Kalp uh, ambition is to become, to be one of the largest players of green hydrogen. It's been quite an investment, it's been, yes, with these two, and then I could, that is lithium and hydrogen have been the two main investments as well as sustainable fuel but concerning uh, a hydrogen green hydrogen our ambition we have a two megawatt pilot which is a pilot in Singe. it's a pilot project and our ambition is to have a hundred megawatts unit producing green hydrogen in Singe. and to mention the ambition of our company the, it's one of the biggest projects in your 50 megawatts. So I believe that in Portugal, companies like Galp is following a tipping point with its ambition has an investment uh, capacity, the skills to be able to build new value chains creating impact and creating skilled jobs in the country so uh, let's pick up on an idea which was mentioned by bruno decarbonization one of the goals uh, gulf schools there are more and more companies uh, that are aware of that fact that need to meet that target most the question is will most be able to meet the, the target or not well let's let's try to see 
um, the path, but the decarbonation pace and commitment for zero emission by 2050, this path and this pace will not allow them to achieve these objectives by 2050. So up to 2030, there has to be an increased investment um, acceleration and a roadmap of concrete initiatives with objectives in terms of the decarbonation objectives in the value chain of our companies. This is very, this is what stood out from the study we carried out. Let me emphasize that there are more and more initiatives which seem sometimes to be loose ones, but from an aggregate point of view, show an interesting impact. Let me give you an example of a recent initiative that we were part of in Portugal, which will have an impact in reducing carbon emission of 1.6%, all carbon emissions in Portugal, on which relates to uh, concrete solutions for uh, the electrification of the Portuguese households. Uh, with This was done with Smart Energy Lab and others, with the participation of the Portuguese economy, of Portuguese economies and the Academy, academy, uh, the academy Bosch and others, EDP. And in the end, it's something which is very concrete in addition to the other initiatives that we carried out with our customers, which are more on strategic plan systems, data components, but very concrete uh, topics, but in an aggregated way will allow later on a transition, which we hope will be quicker and more accelerated. Have you more, have you more invested in sustainable solutions examples accenture also is committed to these objectives of course there are sectors and within those uh, companies that will be able to achieve uh, their objectives and those companies which will be more difficult for clearly we have the utilities with a concern there are almost reaching um, the decarbonation point, the banking, and the, um, the financing uh, of, that, of that sector, service uh, companies where Accenture is integrated. The task is simpler. It has more to do with adopting practices, culture, uh, with responsibilities and uh, in practical aspects. Concerning the six uh, um, factors I mentioned, we developed several projects in Portugal and at, at an international level. Let me emphasize the, the scope three emissions, which has a lot to do more, a lot more to do with knowing that there are uh, emissions that we generate, indirectly generated, and then those that over uh, the during the uh, value chain, the supply chain will Im entail uh, f footprints. It, in, it entails us on how to rethink how companies consume and how the uh, sourcing is done. And also concerning data, there's a taxonomy uh, of data, European legislation, regulation, which is being uh, which is important in terms of taxonomy, it has to be understood by all parties. And then a data system supporting the RPs, um, companies RPs, supporting and the analytics and connectivity as well, allowing us to be able to measure, as I've mentioned earlier, to measure, to act, and to take informed decisions. And these are some of the topics we've been working on. Uh, Juan mentioned, um, traced the map where we stand and how demanding this path will be. What path is Ericsson is being followed in relation to a more sustainable world? Well, you know, in our analysis, we see that out of our greenhouse gas emissions that last year were approximately, I think, 28 million tons, 
uh, 1% or less than 1% comes from our direct operations. 8% comes, let's say, upstream from our supply chain. And more than 90% comes from the energy consumption of the equipments that we deliver to our customers, right? So when we put the focus on this 90%, what we are doing together with our partners in the industry is to make more efficient equipment, right? And then today, latest technology available, like for like comparison, is around between 30 and 40% more efficient than previous generation, so to say. On top of that, 5G is around 10 times more efficient than 4G per data. So the focus of our R&D is how to make our products significantly more efficient. This is what we call how to break the energy curve, which means you know, how, because the amount of data you know, in the networks is not going to decrease all the way around. It's going to grow exponentially. So how can we, the vendors, make sure that the energy consumption of those equipment running the data is lower than in the previous generations, taking you know, the uptake in the data growth, which is you know, exponential every year, right? And this is what the, the, the main focus we are doing. In, in com internally, we have a target uh, to become net zero uh, by 40, uh, 2040 in, in the entire value chain, and, and, and in our direct operations, net zero by 2030. Also, by 2030, we want to halve emissions in the, in the entire value chain uh, versus the 2020 baseline. And that's what we are doing. I, I used to say that in Ericsson, we were talking about sustainability before even the sustainability world came along, or at least was so widely uh, you know, spread out as it is today. Uh, and this is uh, in the heart of the DNA of the Ericsson products. Nice to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> Danielle. Um, Danielle, what about the breakthroughs in Nokia? As I was saying, Sustainability for us has these three areas. From the technological point of view, as I was saying, we try to minimize our footprint via the energy efficiency of our products, our constant innovation in having new processes for our equipment. In the landline and mobile network. We have processes that reduce the consumption of our equipment from 50 to 70%. So this is clearly an important asset for our customers when uh, there are critical communication um, networks they can reduce their um, emissions footprint. In our operations, 20-25% depend on, on traditional energy, 70-75% renewable energies. And in our value chain, we're also actively working with our partners that are part and parcel of our value chain so that we may attain our objectives and targets to reduce CO2 gas emissions. This is what we're doing to reduce our footprint. And then, of course, if you have efficient products and if you have a supply chain which is optimized, streamlined, we develop projects to decarbonize the industries and also in the energy sector. All of this duly leveraged by the unique opportunity the Western world has to contribute towards the fourth industrial revolution, where we need to produce more and more and more. And we are now in a moment in time where we need to relaunch sustainable economic growth and we need to produce more and more and more. So this production should be sustainable. As of uh, 2035, there's the European 
targets to end the use of uh, combustion engine uh, cars. Uh, I believe uh, you sounded pessimistic. The end of uh, fossil fuels in 12 years is unrealistic. I am an innovation director, so I need to be the eternal optimist and resilient. These targets for 2025 is the end of the selling of fossil fuel engine cars. We're also working on sustainable fuels. Could you, would you like to elaborate on this? It's not fossil fuel, but on biomass or urban solid waste. We've had last year, for example, a partnership whereby we did in Portugal the first airplane trip fueled with sustainable fuel, enabling a 35% reduction of emissions. But when I say this is a pass, um, I have to say that many of these solutions are in their pilot phase, already industrial pilot phase, but it's not a mass solution. And if this shift was very quick, the sustainable fuels would be more expensive. So the question is, as consumers, are we ready to have more expensive trips by car or airplane with uh, more expensive but more sustainable fuels? So the transition must be equitative and ethical so that the society as a whole and all the countries in the world are part and parcel of this transition. We need to produce more, consume less. We need to learn to, con to produce in our backyard. As Europeans, we were used to have access to energy and they were, were produced very close to our home. And this will also be a change for consumers. Individually, we as consumers, and being optimistic. So there's the speech of accountability of companies. You're saying that the choice is in the hands of consumers. And there are also opportunities for us as consumers, and we can produce First, to have access to data, to know how are we consuming energy, and also to have access to technologies whereby we can protect our own energy at home. There are sectors that are more difficult to decarbonize, and in the case of Average sized companies, they must belong to clusters and produce green hydrogen to do the decarbonization of their industrial production. So there's a whole series of opportunities. And we as a society, consumers, uh, as businesses, we will be able to do this shift into a more sustainable society and more decarbonized society. Bruno, the war in the Ukraine has been going on for over a year. The current economic context has generated many difficulties and made life harder. Is it or not favorable to the energy transition? Taking advantage of an expression used by uh, Anna, I think we should focus on our backyard. The war and the current geopolitical context makes us think of that. We want to produce green hydrogen, but um, one of the parts are produced in China. Anna has already talked about electrical batteries. If, as a consumer, I am uh, responsible for supply. I will have to worry about where batteries are made. 
and to have an electrical car, but supply it with renewable energy. So there's a transition in the way the society consumers uh, should think. But answering directly to your question, when we look at the supply chain of a company, the, that it should be more sustainable and uh, accountable, we should also be more autonomous in the way we develop our technological solutions, our R&D, so that we meet these sustainable goals and don't depend upon others to attain them. Because when we depend upon others to attain our goals, the risk profile will be bigger. And in reality, this is what is happening because we depend on each other for uh, many different things, and the war has shown this to us. How has Accenture seen the evolution of companies uh, in um, facing this challenge? Well, there isn't a one-size-fits-all. There are different industries, different sectors, and I would say that the energy and utility sector are setting the pace. They are the leaders. And we see Portuguese companies, but not only, that are doing this very quickly on the fast track in those three areas that I've just mentioned a while ago. The banking and insurance sector are very attentive and they are also interested in doing this. And these are the two most important pillars for the economy. Overall, what we also see is that we must start a virtuous cycle. It's the consumer with more sustainable habits that will give rise and ask for sustainable products and services, companies also, and shareholders also. There's a virtuous cycle, and this will happen, I'm, I'm confident. Juan. A while ago, you were talking about the evolution of the implementation of 5G and all those benefits. How can this be speed up? And who is truly responsible for this? Who, uh, who, who is the main responsible for the, the develop of the 5G? And where are we on that track? Well, I think when we talk about sustainability, rather than focus on the companies, on the large enterprises, I think it's, a, it's, it's all up to, up to us, right? It's about human being behaviors. That, that's what we need to work, right? Uh, when we talk about consumers' uh, responsibility, it's about our responsibility, right? And then, uh, as a next step, you know, uh, 5G will enable a more sustainable society in terms of automation, in terms of, as I said before, of energy efficiency. Where we are, well, I said at the beginning, I think, uh, I think we, we in Europe, we are taking the risk of lagging behind because of different reasons, right? Because of fragmentation, because of many different countries, many different regulations, and that is, and that is a challenge for Europe, not, not, not just in the telco sector, you know, all over, but, but this is something that we need to tackle, we need to be aware. Uh, and we need to approach together. Uh, what so, so the main responsibility is from the states of the countries? Well, I think the states are responsible okay. because the technology exists. We cannot say technology doesn't exist. Technology is there. You know? And it is, then we can discuss forever whether or not it's affordable. You know, that, that, that will be another discussion. But, but technology exists, and I think the fact that we don't have a common European Union approach, it is an issue. That is one of the issues, allowing consolidation to telco operators, you know, to avoid the fragmentation so they gain a scale and they are able to take the investments needed to make it happen. Daniel, um, é preciso por... Do we need to speed up the implementation of technology in uh, 5G? I think 5G has several phases. And 5G unlike the previous mobile technology, was able to attain a number of users taking half the time that the previous technology took. In the case of Portugal, um, Portugal is going through its pathway and 
one of the phases is what uh, is happening now in Portugal is to do more efficiently what was done but there's a second phase and the second phase that is happening in Portugal now is preparing digitalization and also in industries and the industries in Portugal are different from other countries when we talk about 5G for Portugal we need to understand what this means and this is being done by the operators in Portugal or the providers and what uh, this might mean uh, for the Portuguese economy and this is an opportunity for Portugal to be re-industrialized. I would like to thank you all for your presence and participation in this debate to all the panelists individually and now the lunch break. We will be back at half past two. Thank you.